Let them praise his gift, Jehovah. They were made at his command. Them forever he established. His decree shall ever stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons, all. Fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his and his glory is exalted, and his and his glory is exalted, and his and his glory is exalted. Far above the earth and sky. Now, I can remember <coughs> back when I was a kid, and I had to go to adult Bible class with my parents. We were visiting somewhere or something. But it always, the teacher would always start out, because they always did verse by verse study out of King James Version of, probably, of the Bible, a method of study that has probably sent more people to hell than immorality. Uh, and the teacher would always start out, okay, where did we end up last week? <laughs> I'm almost in the same boat this week. So I, I, I think we... We're in the process of winding up on, on our study sheet, Roman numeral 8, which is verses 11 and 12. And uh, do you agree with that? Close. Yeah. Because this week's been hectic. The last mm-hmm. uh, When I got around to going over it, I kept wanting to go back to almost start over, but... Uh, I thought it was Roman numeral 10. Huh? I thought it was Roman numeral 10. Yeah. Okay, we got down to 10. <coughs> okay. Well, I'm going to hit 9 just a little bit, because I don't think we spend much about it, and it doesn't need much. But why do you think Paul felt it necessary to tell these Christians in Roman Asia not to lose heart because he was in prison. Well, I figured that they thought that uh, he was truly a man of God and if if, they, if the Lord was going to let him suffer, they might he might let them suffer more than they could stand. So yep. Figure, I got you. There were... There were people actually using Paul's imprisonment to argue against him being a real apostle. Of course, they always pointed to Peter, and Peter was only a year or two behind Paul here. Uh, So, it's about to even out on that. But uh, he wanted them to know that his imprisonment was not working for evil, but was actually accomplishing good. And, uh, you know, Jesus himself said, God would make things work out for good for those that loved him. And uh, that's what's happening here. So we get down to verses 14 through 16, which is... Uh, Essentially, the end of the chapter. I Roman numerals aren't lining up here, right? But uh, Paul goes into a prayer. We've talked about why he would write prayers and what he was hoping to accomplish with that. And one of the main things was. He wanted the people he was communicating with to know what they should be talking to God about. And uh, 
what sticks out to you about this prayer that's in verse 14 through 17a, through the first phase of, phase of the 17th verse? It's a fairly long reading, so. But as you read it, what stands out to you that Paul's pushing? Well, the power of the gospel. Power of the gospel. And who gave the gospel this power? The Spirit. Okay. And they, the Spirit is working hand in glove with who? The Father. God the Father. So he's praying here to the Father. Bow my knees before the Father. And he wants to know that he's in charge of everything. So, he points out that everybody derives their existence from the Father. That is probably one of the biggest issues that people, modern people, overlook. And uh, as a result of failing to realize that you're here, not through some accident or some through set of accidents, happy incidences that occurred, but you're here because the Father God willed that you would be here. Then uh, it changes your whole outlook on things. You don't look at the world the same way. You don't look for blessings to come from the same, same what manner. So, the church uh, it says something about uh, the purpose that's there. He would grant you according to his riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Why? Why do we need power? We need the Holy Spirit's power in us to bring others toward God. Well, we got we got the task of taking the gospel to the world. Right. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. What else? How else could you expand in it and talk about that? <coughs> Bill, are we going to need to? I'm going to take her home, but it's okay. We got it covered. Do you want you want me to go get Mama's chair? And no, 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 no. We'll be okay. Okay. He's going to move the car. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but the church exists. Why? It's a, the church is the. It's the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Therefore, the church is in the world to do what? To save the world, to bring others to Christ, to save the world. To be, to do what Christ would do if he was here in person. So, we've got this purpose, and to do that purpose, we've got to have some power. And we've got to know we've got power. And so the Holy Spirit working in he's us. asking that we be strengthened. And not just strengthened, like, you know, you will be strengthened out here externally on your, you've got a lever or something that you can increase your power. But we're to be strengthened where? In our service to him. Well, I don't know what you're asking. Uh, you know, read the verse there. In the hearts. Huh? Hearts. In our hearts. In our inner man. The 
the part that knows what we're about. The, our identity, our self, our, what we, we realize, what we are. And most of us do not think of ourselves that way. When you look at the world, and you kind of compare yourself to the world, the world everybody that's in the world around you, how do you feel? Strong or weak? I feel like sometimes I just look down and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's hopeless, isn't it? I can't do anything. And maybe you can't, Sam, but who can? Oh, God. Yeah. Pause here a minute and let's let Mary in. Yeah. Rise up. Okay. Isn't there a song like that, Bob, and rise up? Yeah. Baby, let Bruce, let, let Bradley get over there. Mom, she can't help but her sit up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's let yeah. her sit. She, she just sit needs to sit for a few minutes yeah. before she gets up. Because I know I do. I a, can't just... Get you know, the blood up to her head at yeah. that level. She just got to sit up for a few minutes. But we've got to, got to know that we have the power to overcome this world. And sadly, most people in the church don't. Like right now, we're wondering if she got the power to help Mary Ann. Let's just deal with that right now. Why don't you? That's okay. Okay. Turn and bow with me. And let's just take this to God. Father, we are very concerned right now that our lovely, wonderful sister, Mary Ann Kinsey, is fainting. And she's not got the power to get about under her own, own strength. Father, we ask you to strengthen her, to be with her and lift her up. And Father, strengthen her life. Be with her life force that she will know she can can survive and can live. And Father, hold her so close to your heart and just love her because she is your child. And she has been so faithful to you over the years. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So they're going to have to have strength with power. And then we come on down and let's finish this. At 17b through 19. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and height and depth and know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the fullness of God. How does love surpass knowledge? God bless you, Bill. Thank you. Do you think Marianne knows that God loves her right now? Okay. But do you think yeah. uh-huh. okay. as she is that she can feel that? You know Marianne, yes. 
Huh? Knowing Mary Ann, yes. Maybe knowing Mary Ann most, but most of us, when we're in that kind of system, we don't feel it, do we? We've got to know something beyond knowledge. There's got to be something that strengthens us that's greater than what we know. And that's our knowledge of God's love. That His love for us can overcome what is happening. That what we're experiencing is not nearly as powerful as God is. And that it's God's love that regulates how His power is going to be applied. Now, if you had a child and they were experiencing some difficulty, and this thing, this is a little child, so that the contrast is, is here. How much love, how much care would you pour out of them? Every bit of energy you had. Everything that is necessary for the situation. You wouldn't hold anything back, would you? Well, somehow in the church, we've got the idea that God will put out a little power, but not all of it. He won't really put out a whole lot of power. Now, some of that is very is understandable. Now, there were people that went around uh, claiming to exercise God's power, and they were such obvious fakes that we didn't want to be associated with that. But for every fake out there, there's an example where God poured His power out into the lives of his saints and made a difference so that they could overcome the situation they were in. Now, he, he uses some uh, things here and I've got I realize I've got my Roman numeral step on this. But he talks about the breath and the width and the depth and the height. It's a four dimensional object here. And God's love is four dimensional in that it reaches to us, it reaches to those even that, that don't acknowledge Him as God. God still loves them. He can reach down into the darkest mire of sin and love somebody and exert or bring forces to bear in their life that if they will pay attention to it will cause them to, to seek his, his forgiveness and His love. Now, he sums this all up in verses 20 and 21. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, why would he say it that way? Somewhat of a reminder to us of the power of God. Just, just he is able. What do we do with the power of God? When we're describing it, when we're 
thinking about how it will apply to a situation, what do we do with it? We limit it. We limit it. There's a, a device in electronics that was a lot more commonly used back in the old analog days with uh, before we got into solid state and so forth, but it's called a choke. <laughs> what it amounts to is here's a here's the line that's carrying the power that's going to do the work. And around that line is a coil. This carries a small amount of power, very low voltage usually. Guess how much power you get out of the end of the line. It's got the power that's coming from the from the transformer. How much ever that choke will let you have. Yeah. It depends on where you set that choke. If you turn it all the way open, you get all the, the power the line will carry. But if you turn it down, and we used to use that to control things like volume in a radio, that's how they. That's how the early volume controls worked. We, they were chokes that just choked off the power going to the speakers and kept the volume level down to what we wanted. Well, we need to quit choking God's power. We need to realize that even when we think a situation is impossible that God is still there and sometimes we know too much for our own good we know that people are going to die so we see somebody who's really seriously ill and we pray for him to, for God to heal him but one in our mind we're saying what? But it's okay if you don't. We're limiting the situation. Well, our prayers are not going to over overcome God's will. Death is a part of our lives. But even death can be conquered. It was, wasn't it? And will be. Hmm? And will be. And will be. And so, even though death may come, there's something beyond that death. And that's God's power that regulates all that. If we're going to be the church, we have got to quit thinking of ourselves as weak and powerless. We've got to quit thinking that God's power is limited and he won't do for us what he did for people in the past and, he, and all of these things. And we just need to get out of God's way and start praying as Paul prays that we'll know what God can do. Now let's let's deal with the power of the gospel for a couple of minutes here. Two examples in my own life that I'm kind of kind of ashamed of. There was a guy named Jimmy. He was in his forties or fifties. And his grandkids lived with him and his wife. His wife was a faithful Christian in church every week. Jimmy was a nice guy. I was the captain on a joy bus. And I picked the grandkids up and brought them to church. Doris, who was the grandmother, came, came on her own. But uh, every week I'd go by Jimmy's house and I'd talk to him about whether the kids were going to ride tomorrow. And he was always friendly and always just 
you know, the kids will be there and everything was great and wonderful, but he never would seriously address himself. I just wrote him off. That's one guy that's conversion proof. He'll never be a Christian. Well, I retired from preaching and moved down here and all this time his wife Doris had been praying that something would reach Jimmy. And guess what? Several years ago Jimmy was baptized and he was a very faithful member of the church. Things that I thought weren't making any impact on him at all were among the reasons he gave for why he became a Christian. And there's another example. And I'm going to use a fake name here because this one hits too close to home. This guy, I'm going to say he's, his name was uh, George. George was the son of a Church of Christ preacher. A very conservative, straight-laced Church of Christ preacher. And he and his dad were like that. And it's strange because they still worked together. His dad had quit preaching. And they were in a secular business together. But George rebelled and he did everything he could to get away from his family and from the church. He uh, got heavy into drugs. He, he was a professional rock musician. He played lead guitar for some of the best rock bands in North Texas for several years until his drug habit got so bad he couldn't hold a job and he ended up getting out of the music business and going to work stringing cable in buildings with his dad. George was claimed he was an atheist. He sure gave every evidence of being. He was a girlfriend. His girlfriend was a mother of two kids that rode the, the joy buses. And she had a number of health issues. I would go to visit her in the hospital and, you know, you have prayer with people you go to visit. George would leave rather than be present when I was praying. He would make up some excuse, this, that, and the other. Well, guess what? George is a Christian today. George and Mary are church every time the doors open. Mary's still got more health issues than you shake a stick at. But they're meeting them with faith and together. We've got to quit limiting what God can do. There are people we all know that we think of as being conversion proof. They're just not interested. They're just not, they just won't let you do what you think you have to do to reach them. <clears throat> but guess what? If you get out of the way and let God work, there may be a way that not you, but somebody else can reach them. Sam? Well, I was just going to say about kind of what you were saying earlier, a few minutes ago, <clears throat> that, um, you know, everybody's life has a beginning and an end. And I don't think that we should let it trouble our faith you know when sometimes God just says no and you know that's going that's going to be it uh, it's not I think we should be 
open to accepting whatever the outcome would be. Because I, I know I've had um, my uncle's wife. She was a wonderful woman, you know, faithful, always went to church, and you know, and they had two young boys, and she got cancer, and you know, and everyone prayed, and you know, and she was sick for a number of years, but then she finally passed away. But, you know, life goes on. It's just, I don't know, I guess if you kind of look at it like that, it's not, it's more of understanding what God's will is. A lot of it is understanding God's will. But a lot of it is is realizing that God can act when we can't. You know, we all knew uh, Wayne. Wayne Scott, elder here, fine man. I've known him since he was a junior in high school. Prayed for that man to survive his cancer. But God took him. Well, God, God's will was there. But Wayne was the kind of person that didn't have to fear death. A lot of my prayers had to do with Wayne's role in this church. And I, I just felt like that Wayne was an essential part of this church continuing to function. Well, guess what? That was three years ago, and the church is still here. I still miss Wayne because he was a good friend and a great man, and you don't quit missing people like that. But God expresses His will, and even when His will isn't exactly what we want. If we'll get out of the way and let him work and just do what we're supposed to do as Christians, God will make it work out. He'll make it happen. Now, any other comments or questions? All right, we're we're the the first. We finished up the first half of the book of Ephesians, and I said we'd talk this week about what we do going forward. I'm prepared to continue. The second half is different than the first half. First half is doctrinal, the why. Second half is the what, the application. And it'll go faster than the first half because it's it's more straightforward. Uh, but what do y'all want to do? We could we could find somebody who's ready to teach. Do something else. Doesn't the second half contain the verse that the Church of Christ hangs their no instrumental music on? <laughs> it does have one of the verses. Yes. Not <laughs> what the verse was talking about. <laughs> Didn't That's what they always the used to say. That's all they always used to tell me when I was growing up. You know, they like quote uh, Ephesians five sixteen. I think it is. Yeah. Then you make melody in your hearts. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, what are your wishes? Speak, you don't want to be talking once. I don't mind keeping going, but I want to study the Old Testament next time. Okay. That's just my two cents. I think Jim was scheduled to teach next, and he is also maybe scheduled for some serious surgery, which may mean he's out for hopefully just a week or two, or maybe more. So he might prefer, I'll ask him. Jim, would you prefer with Jerry going ahead and 
<laughs> as far as that goes, it doesn't matter. But I, I told Jerry last week that I would love to continue and finish this, right. this study here. Uh, it's been first three chapters been good. I'd like to get the next thing personally, but um, and, and if I start teaching and I miss a week or two, then okay. <laughs> I think continue. Yeah. Go ahead and continue the book. Okay, we'll do that then. And uh, take one and pass them on and Somebody at the end gather up the extra so that we have some for those of us that forget next week. This uh, next passage, and I've, I've been putting this these lessons together. The lessons have been built around the passage rather than weeks or the calendar. And the first 16 verses of chapter 4 are the next passage. And it has to do with two, well, actually one. The chapter 4 has to do with two charges that the church is supposed to do. And we're going to talk about the first one, which is in the first 16 verses uh, first. And then we'll talk about the second one. But... uh, I'm going to let you have the time, rest of this time, and you can read and get ahead and study verses 1 through 16 of chapter 4. Uh, notice the change in how Paul talks. It's been, it's no less authoritative. It's still obviously Paul that's talking, but it's very obvious he's changing from one line of thought to another. Now, you, in a academic setting, we say he's going from the theoretical to the practical. But there's not any real theoretical in the Bible. It's all absolute. So, uh, we'll see you then.
Yeah. 